Hello, and welcome to Alex Toth in Depth. This is Paul Fricke, cartoonist, comics professor, and self admitted Toth fanatic. All his career, and since his passing in 2006, Alex Toth was known as an artist's artist. And in this first episode, we'll scratch the surface and then begin to dig deep and try to answer just why. Why is Toth timeless? Now, Toth was a, a giant of comics and animation, of concept art and character design. He was influential in his time, and it still is to this day. He was known for a strong sense of design, high standards in his work and in the work of others. His use of black or black spotting or spotting of blacks in his design and comics pages, and perhaps most of all, for simplification. There are many books about his work. I have a large stack of them here in my studio, and uh, so they're at hand, and I can uh, refer to them any way I'd like, any time I'd like. And some said when I was talking to them about doing the show that maybe there is too much coverage of Toth, or maybe there are enough books. Uh, but I say um, there's never enough, <laughs> and there's plenty uh, for a deeper dive uh, in a, a variety of ways. Now, I've always loved Toth's work um, as a kid before I even knew his name. And then when I started to notice his name, and for years I tried to, I just kind of took it, uh, took his work in, and there was something about it that attracted me. I wasn't always sure what. I knew some things, but not everything. And then uh, several years ago, I started a blog. And I wanted to delve further into Toth's work. I was kind of obsessed about it, but I wanted to analyze it more deeply and try to figure out just what it was about his work that attracted me so much. And that's still not enough. So that's why I'm doing the show here. Now, Toth had an early start in comics at 15, and he worked for those uh, late teen years producing, uh, you know, decent work and uh and learning on the job. He worked hard to improve. And then by the early 50s, even though he was 20, 21, 22, was already producing masterpieces in comics art. Uh, he led the charge in many ways and inspired other artists to do better. Uh, this was at a time when comics were uh, starting to uh, get some pressure uh, from the Senate and from a book written called Seduction of the Innocent by Dr. Frederick Wortham. And a lot of artists were starting to find less work and starting to uh, be ashamed or uh, not appreciated for their uh, work in comics. And Toth just took up the mantle and went at it and went at it. And a lot of uh, artists were inspired by that and, and followed him up the hill as John Romita would later say. Now, he worked for a variety of publishers and, and a variety of genres uh, through that time and into the 80s. Uh, also, starting in the late 50s, he was influential in the early days of TV animation and design. And then later, when he was uh, a self-imposed hermit and kind of in retirement or semi-retirement, he engaged with fandom more than most would, uh, and more than most professionals or former professionals did. And he was a pen pal and did lots of uh, doodles and such for the last 20 or 30 years of his life. It's tough to pinpoint Toth because many artists are known for a particular character or a certain you know, body of work in an in a outstanding series, and Toth just doesn't really have that. There's no title, there's no character, there's no strip that he's identified with exactly long term. Now, you could say he has some uh, affiliation with Zorro. You could say that he uh, is known for uh, designing Space Ghost, the Hanna-Barbera cartoon of the mid-60s. But uh, in terms of a long and large body of work, he's just not associated with that at all. He did great work and had an incredible influence on people 
even though he worked from very poor, mediocre scripts most of his career in comics. And some would say that a lot of scripts in comics during that period were subpar anyway. So he almost was creating little gems in, in, uh, of art and storytelling in a industry that wasn't known for high quality in terms of its content. He did romance and adventure, horror comics and superhero work. He did humorous cartooning, uh, and he d did a lot of science fiction work as well. Uh, he just covered the gamut, and it seemed that he had a restless uh, intellect and soul. And so he may not have been set up to do a long uh, piece of work uh, with uh, one character. Uh, any number of things would probably uh, dissuade him from pursuing anything for too long. That could be himself, editors, publishers, the industry, whatever else. He would often, in his Hanna-Barbera days, walk off and only to be uh, uh, coerced back. Now, he was sometimes a difficult man, and he still got work because he was so good. And he had high standards, and uh, that led him to tear up pages and stop jobs or not deliver them if, um, uh, if the editor... Uh, wasn't of the same mind, or he wouldn't take on jobs because of this kind of uh, attitude. Now, sometimes those high standards and personality helped him, and sometimes they hurt him. But I should say uh, his personality and whatever conditions he may have had are not really the point of this show. I really want to focus on the show instead on his work. His approach was simplicity and clarity, rooted in sound design and storytelling. Uh, another devotee of his, Howard Chaikin, uh, uses the, the line, uh, design in the service of narrative is what comics are. And Toth em uh, exemplified this. He was very good at a variety of things. He was a complete cartoonist. He, he, he focused on acting and staging in his storytelling, uh, lighting and composition, panel to panel and the full page. He mastered lettering. He was great at character differentiation uh, on page design and flow. And he did a variety of genre work and a variety of style and approach that makes it appealing to check out what he did when all throughout his career. Now, you take all that and then you couple it with an unending urge to innovate and you have a, an artist of, of note. Um, now... I talked about his uh, appeal early on and what made him stand out. Now, when he was trying to learn his comics in his late teens and learn his art, he seems to have studied uh, from uh, something he ordered uh, through the, the, you know, the comic advertisements and through the mail called the Famous Artist School. And there were a variety of artists who were associated with that, Robert Fawcett and Norman Rockwell and Albert Dorn and others. And Toth seems to have uh, taken these things very seriously and worked them hard. And you can see a noticeable improvement in his work right around the time that he did that. Uh, Jesse Hamm, who has uh, written and spoken about this um, in his articles and at, on his uh, Twitter feed, uh, Jesse Hamm Art Tips, makes this point and um, and very well. And Toth was known during that time then for lauding certain artists, Noel Sickles being one of them. Now, Noel Sickles was an artist who was big in adventure strips with Scorchy Smith, and he was studio mates with Milt Kniff and influenced Kniff in his runs on Terry and the Pirates and then Steve Canyon. But after, I don't know, a couple of years, Sickles moved on from adventure strips and became uh, an illustrator the rest of his life and a painter. But Toth was very, very obsessed with Sickles' work and did a lifelong study of him. And he would take the Sunday pages and the daily pages and clip them out. And then he would make copies of them for himself and then to <laughs> pass on to other artists. And it kind of spread through the industry and everyone was taking in Sickles' work and applying what 
what he had done in his work. Uh, later in life, that became true for Toth. There were some books out of his work, but some of them were out of print and some of them were, were tough to find. And in the animation industry, especially uh, stacks of his animation design and concept work were copied and photocopied and poorly done and handed on and handed on. So what he did early in his life, um, people did with his work later on. Now, since that time, a lot more art book books have come out uh, in the eighties. There's a, a variety of magazines and soft cover books and hardcover books dedicated to his work, including and culminating in the most recent books, the last decade, the, uh, the large books, genius isolated genius illustrated and genius animated. They are three gigantic volumes. Um, so you can tell with all this kind of coverage, he's an artist favorite, uh, the artist artist, as I mentioned earlier. Now I was obsessed with the work too, and I couldn't always get my hands on those kinds of uh, stacks of paper and copies. So I would, uh, you know, grab up whatever I could and I would, you know, dig into the, uh, at the comic shops and at the comic conventions, uh, just looking for his work and, Pay, you know, opening them up and paging through them to find a Toth story if I could. And I would, you know, go to the Overstreet Price Guide and try to find all of his work and made a list from it. And I know a lot of people over the years then started buying a lot of his older comics before they became too expensive and building up their own collections. And I didn't do that. I was uh, bu busy building a career and then starting a family. And then in 2001, um, another Toth fan started tothfans.com and made it possible for a lot of us to find Toth's work online. And a lot of people who had bought a lot of these comics would scan them and share them. There was a page of the day on that site that everyone looked forward to. And for me, it was an oasis. I couldn't believe what I found and it, and it fed the interest in Toth's work, which led to my blog and everything else. The appeal for me was hard to pinpoint because uh, I think there was just something about his work, uh, what he did with his line, with his panel composition, his page composition, his sense of design, uh, the spotting of blacks, all of that added up to something that just clicked in my head and um, that I didn't really see in other people's work, uh, not as a complete package. All of this attraction to his work led to a later application of his work. There was a time early in my career working on Troll Lords. I, I would do a lot of cross hatching and busy work. Um, I just didn't have the guts to lay the the simplicity and the blacks down like Toth did, and I tried to as the series went on, and then in my work at DC Comics and and after. So I've applied it, and I'm trying to do that more and more. Not copying Toth, but trying to, you know, filter through myself um, the principles that he operated from. Now, I mentioned earlier that I had started this blog called Toth Picks. And through writing about his work and analyzing it more deeply, um, I found more specifically what got into my head and, and made my head buzz about his work. What was it that, uh, that brought me back to his work time and time again? And, and, uh, and what I wrote about, you know, all of that stuff is what I mentioned earlier. In 2012, I started teaching at the Minneapolis College of Art and Design and students there will tell you that I bring Toth up nearly every week. Um, and since that time, uh, I've been reading and studying Toth further, and it's been edifying because it's helped me sift through and sort out exactly what can be the appeal to younger artists about his work. Because of the poor quality of the scripts uh, that he took on that were generally available in the comics industry during his career, they're, they can be fun stories, but not, not only always great or um, life-changing uh, stories that stand the test of time. So there's a, a difference, I think, between 
reading Toth and, and studying Toth. In future episodes, um, I'd like to cover what I think are, you know, some of the best stories to, to read um, and some of the best stories uh, to study. There, there is a big difference in that. And although it's very important that you read his stories to find out, you know, what makes them work and what makes them tick and how he's telling the story, um, you can also, you know, glean and, and gain a lot from uh, unpacking it and and checking out, you know, how he went about it exactly. We'll cover that in future episodes, and at least it'll give a starting point, to, especially to those who have not uh, come across his work much, um, like where to dig in first and where to start. Now, before we finish here, I'd like to do like a quick chronology of his work, which will also give a... Uh, uh, an indication of uh, other things we'll cover in future episodes. Now, he started again his career at 15 doing a variety of uh, comics and uh, started with mostly superhero books uh, from the mid to late 40s. He did a few Rex the Wonder Dog stories that are just super solid. He did a bunch of westerns for DC and other publishers, including a really great run of covers uh, for all Western comics uh, featuring Johnny Thunder. Again, he did a a ton of um, romance comics for Standard Comics, uh, which are collected in a book called Setting the Standard. He did some crime comics, including some supposed 3D comics and the classic The Crushed Gardenia. And then in the mid-50s, 55 and 56, while serving and on duty in Japan... He created his own John Fury comics for others um, serving to uh, enjoy. And he had designs that that would become a uh, a regular adventure strip, but that never quite came to fruition. Um, When he came back, he, you know, was scrambling around figuring out where he fit in and what kind of work he should do. And then by the late 50s, he started doing a a bunch of... um, work for Dell Comics, and these would be TV and movie adaptations. Um, He did work on Zorro, uh, a favorite character of his, and those are uh, really well-collected works. Uh, My preference would be the the toned comics that were reprinted and collected later on. I I vastly prefer those to the the original colored Dell Comics. Also in the late 50s, he started working on uh, TV animation, and he was at the forefront of the earliest days of TV animation with with shows like Clutch Cargo and um, Space Angel. By the early 60s, he started working on uh, stuff for Hanna-Barbera and was involved to some extent um, on Johnny Quest, but then like... Herculoids and Space Ghost and uh, and then Super Friends uh, by the early 70s. Um, he was involved doing comics during that entire time, um, even while he was working on animation from like the early 60s till the late 80s. Um, also in the early to you know, mid 60s, 64, 65, he was doing a lot of work for um, uh War in comics. He started doing black and white uh, toned and, and otherwise comics, um, mostly in the horror and war genres. Um, and it's really beautiful stuff. And he, he, it seemed like with every single story, he was trying to figure out, um, you know, new ways to handle tone and, and to capture mood and, and such. Um, he also did some really fun comics in the mid 60s called Cartoons. And these have all been collected in a book called One for the Road. And that's some, that's him just having fun on the page and really loose. It, it, that, that work, to me, uh, tells the story that he easily could have been part of the Mad uh, Magazine uh, troupe. Um, perhaps not a gang of idiots, but he, he could have easily handled uh, himself and held his own in, in that group. Um, and again... Um, while he was doing Super Friends, he kept his hand in doing comics uh, in the late 60s and early 70s. He did a ton of work again for DC, uh, some romance, lots of horror, 
and um, and a lot of war comics. He kept his hand in comics uh, all the way through his career, but a, but a, did a, what I think are some of his best works uh, in the early seventies for DC. Then in the mid seventies, he created his own character, Bravo for Adventure, and was able to have that serialized in um, a Warren magazine, and then collected. Um, in uh, its own book. And that's been reprinted again more recently. Now, again, I said that in his latter part of his career, I think he got all used up. He, he got a little down when his lot down when his mom and his wife died. And that's when the hermit face started of his career. And he did less and less printed finished work although there are some gems he did here and there on his own and were printed in small magazines or an occasional cover here and there. But he was heavily involved from his little house and his kitchen table in comics fandom and and, uh, was very engaged and contributed a lot with his sketches and doodles, as he called them, uh, all the way through to the end of his days. Considering all this... Uh, we're left to still answer the question more fully. Uh, To me, Toth's work is timeless because he set a high bar in character and page design, uh, in in black spotting and and depth in his picture making, with his use of tone and texture and pattern, uh, composition and cropping, especially cropping, his storytelling, and then sheer drawing ability. Uh, just unbelievable work. And he was way ahead of his time in all of that. He was working on this and doing these things when no one else was yet. And when in this time, a lot of people still aren't. And then despite working in those fields of comics and animation, mainly as it was produced was considered disposable children's entertainment. And despite that, he kept asking more of himself. He did it all as well or better than anybody and and refused to repeat himself largely. He needed to try new things and and be creative and experiment. He could have been among the best illustrators had he chosen that field and, and still with the illustrations he did stacks up well. In his use of line uh, with striving for simplicity and truth in his work, to me, his work is the perfect fit for comics. He, he laid down the, the blueprint in his work and writings with which what is to me the best approach, uh, the model for comics as well as animation and in illustration and any other design endeavor, not only for himself, but for us and work to follow. There will be more episodes of this show where we I have a, a long list of topics to uh, work from and to cover. And I'd like to interview some uh, artists that are into Toth and roll those out. So stay tuned for future episodes. That's all the time we're giving to this episode. This again is Paul Fricky for the Alex Toth In-Depth Show. Comments, questions, or compliments, you can email paul at opaulo.com or you can find us at Alex Toth In-Depth on Instagram. Be sure to subscribe to the podcast on iTunes, Google Play, and Stitcher. Just type in Alex Toth In-Depth. Leave a review. Tell your friends. There's also a video version of this show on YouTube uh, and other video outlets. So subscribe and spread the word there, too. Uh, So until next time, go with Toth. And don't forget, less is more. (laughs) 